Coming up on Market to Market. Snow enters the complicated weather picture. Two different interests of the meat industry sit on the same side of the table. Monumental impacts on Western stakeholders. And these are all over San Juan County there. I think the market had and market analysis with Ted Seifert, next. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, October 23 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. The housing sector keeps hitting on red, and the market has rewarded both sellers with higher prices and buyers with low interest rates. Single-family home building continued to rocket in September with a 1.9% increase in new home starts in most of the U.S., with the exception of the Midwest. The existing home market hit a 14-year high, leaping 9.4%. However, inventory is having trouble keeping pace as demand rises, pushing prices higher. Long-term mortgage rates declined again this week as the 30-year loan marked an all-time low of 2.80%. The housing sector is driving the economy, but consumers are still behind the wheel. Grocery store options were limited early in the pandemic, but keep expanding as new alternatives fight for shelf space and places in the grocery cart. This week, two protein providers joined forces in an unlikely pairing to ask the government for clarity. Peter Tubbs reports. As cultured meats continue development in the lab, labels for the future products are being discussed. This week, the North American Meat Institute and the Alliance for Meat, Poultry and Seafood Innovation which represents stakeholders in the emerging cell-based and cultured meat industry, called on the USDA to develop mandatory labeling standards for future cell-based and cultured meat products. The two groups are encouraging the development of labeling standards before products become commercially available to give certainty to the evolving business and speed the rollout of products to consumers once the technical hurdles of lab-grown meat are cleared. It, to, to put it very simply, words matter. What you call something matters. It matters both in terms of marketing, in terms of uh, general discourse, the consumer's understanding of what the words mean, and also from a legal point of view. The regulatory requirements are complicated. The Food Safety and Inspection Division of the USDA and the FDA share oversight of the new industry. The FDA oversees cell banks, cell collection, and cell growth and differentiation. The FSIS takes over compliance at cell harvest and monitors production and labeling of food products that may one day be sold to consumers. The regulatory complexity has brought advocates for both the emerging industry and traditional meat production to the table. Both sides hope that being involved in the process will lower hurdles in the future as well as reducing consumer confusion once products hit store shelves. It's interesting to watch this develop because on the one hand, you're talking about companies that could be seen as being on opposite sides of the aisle, if you will, uh, and yet they, they've established this partnership very early on to present a, uh, a united food supply chain front to regulators in particular who are forging into brand new territory. The regulatory groundwork is being laid for products that may not emerge from the lab for years. No cell-based or cultured meat products have been introduced for sale in the United States. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Elections have consequences. Some are visible on day one. Others take more time to sort. For those in the middle of a generations-long cultural debate, the back and forth over Western land use can be a monumental task. Josh Bittner reports in our cover story. On 
his way out of office, lame duck President Barack Obama proclaimed 1.35 million acres in southeastern Utah a national monument. Bears Ears, named for distinctive twin buttes towering over San Juan County's diverse high desert landscape, was the first monument created at the request of, and in collaboration with, a coalition of various Native American governments. Some people think that the natural resources of Utah should be controlled by a small handful of very distant bureaucrats located in Washington. And guess what? They're wrong. While Obama's move was hailed by archaeologists and conservationists for protecting the region's myriad cultural and natural sites, one year later, President Trump shrank Bears Ears by 85 percent and split the monument into two non-contiguous sites, Shosh Jaw and Indian Creek. Critics warned former protected lands could be opened up for fossil fuel and mineral development. Modifying the Bears Ears National Monument. Trump's action drew the ire of local tribal constituents who consider the area sacred. A handful of various stakeholder lawsuits alleging presidential overreach spun up and were consolidated into one case by a federal judge. You want to make America great? Then why aren't you talking to the first Americans? I'm here to tell you, if it's a fight they want, it's a fight they're going to get. Though local leadership initially supported the Trump administration, voter backlash over partisan gerrymandering gave way to the San Juan County Commission's first ever Native American majority in 2018 who promptly reversed course. However, judicial backlog and coronavirus have litigants still awaiting their day in court. So many lives have been lost unnecessarily because this president cares more about the stock market than he does Some hope a Biden win in November could bend circumstances in their favor, but others warn of a breaking point. This ping pong back and forth between maybe a conservative president and a liberal president and going back and forth, that's not good for the land. You know, the land should not be political football. Josh Ewing is executive director of Friends of Cedar Mesa, a grassroots organization founded in 2010 to support regional public land use. Based in Bluff, Utah, the group's Bears Ears Education Center helps enlighten tourists drawn to a massive county larger than some states on the eastern seaboard combined. Ewing also describes San Juan as the most archaeologically rich county in the U.S. People aren't used to just walking up to a cliff dwelling, walking up to a 2,000-year-old uh, pictograph. They need to know how to behave in those sensitive areas. Archaeological sites are easily damaged, and once they're damaged, they can't be recreated. So this is the edge of our permit. We run all the way up this canyon, and everything inside of these rims is, is part of the monument. The vastness of San Juan County is one reason ranchers Tyler and Sean Ivins breathe the sigh of relief upon Trump's rollback. The brothers run 300 head of cattle on mountain and desert allotments within Obama's previous proclamation area. So these are Anasazi ruins, and these are all over San Juan County. There, there are thousands of them. To put it in perspective, one acre is 210 feet by 210 feet square which would more than protect that area or that site. And if there were 100,000 of them, that would be 100,000 acres. And they wanted to take 13 times that, which is 1.3 million acres. In our opinion, that's overkill. You know, it takes in a lot of area that doesn't have a lot of bearing on it. Over half of Utah's iconic landscapes already fall under federal oversight and the Ivans say adding to the management backlog is unsustainable. Some locals have gotten to work developing the area to capture more tourist dollars. Others hope recent bipartisan passage of the Great American Outdoors Act with $3 billion in annual conservation and maintenance funds spread nationwide also brings some relief. We have counters out there, trail counters, and we've seen an uptick in visitation. Over 20 million acres of Utah's public lands fall under the purview of the U.S. Bureau of Land Management, which helps coordinate land use among various stakeholders. 
overseeing anything from motorized activities to hunting, hiking, or administering grazing permits. I'm a big advocate of multiple use. I think it's a great principle for the American public. Uh, it, it allows us to, to all play in the same sandbox, essentially. Gary Torres is field manager for the BLM, based out of the agency's local Monticello office. He says while President Obama designated Bears Ears a national monument, there was never enough time for a formal management plan to be drawn up before the Trump administration began calling the shots. We had our, our marching orders. We, we knew what we needed to do. You know, BLM does this all the time, planning. We, we plan for public lands. Whether Trump's monument rollback in San Juan County is ultimately upheld or thrown out by the courts, Torres says great care was taken by BLM in public meetings with input from a diverse range of collaborators. We need to be respectful of each other's activities, and we need to manage those resources so that they're here for my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. And I think that that's the beauty of multiple use and sustained yield, is, is that we're trying to do things that make sense now, and for the future. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Next, the Market to Market report. Weather and demand again drove the trade train higher. For the week, December wheat increased eight cents, while the nearby corn contract jumped 17 cents. Strong export news helped push the soy complex to a 51-month high at one point this week. The November soybean contract gained 34 cents. December soybean meal improved 1890 per ton. December cotton expanded $1.37 per hundredweight. In the dairy parlor, November class 3 milk futures added $1.27. A down week in the livestock sector. December cattle shed 505. November feeders dropped 538. And the December lean hog contract sold off 277. In the currency markets, U.S. dollar index declined 91 ticks. December crude oil fell $1.27 per barrel. Comex gold lost a dollar per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs commodity index improved a point to finish at 361.55. Joining us now to give us some insight is regular market analyst Ted Seifert. Ted, good to see you. Really happy to be here, Paul. I know you are, <laughs> and uh, thank you for making the trip. And as you drive, I want to ask you about what you saw in the fields, but mm -hmm. we need to start with wheat because for the majority of the week, that mm -hmm. was the big story. Yeah. But it's not making sense why when you look at a fundamental sense. So why is that market rising? Well, almost why not, right? <laughs> Um, you know, you look at it, we've got production concerns in a number of areas here, Black Sea area, that's, you know, that's an issue. Although at the end of the week, we saw a little bit of weather, weather forecast for the plains. So, you know, why the strength on Friday? We were seeing some news stories uh, that Algeria, which is one of the largest importers, um, isn't having a good relationship with Russia right now about quality. Algeria wants lower prices, or, or Algeria wants better quality. Russia wants better prices, and so that little spat, maybe we start to see a little bit more come our way. Uh, and the fact, like you pointed out, the dollar was down almost a thousand points uh, over the week. So we're getting more competitive on the global scale. Now, we haven't yet seen our wheat exports take off, but there is optimism about that. The chart looks good. Overall, rising tide in the grains, and it was just, it was wheat's week to kind of lead the way higher, I suppose. So there's also the drought conditions mm -hmm. in the area you talked about, Russia, right. but there's also dry conditions in the United States. Right. Is the weather going to giveth and taketh in this market? Mm. Wait, wait, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that, Paul. Well, I mean, because if it, we get rain this weekend, mm -hmm. which there's right. a big amount of moisture yeah. to come in the United States, there's right. also rain. That's more in beans when we talk about South America. But, I mean, weather could, that's where I'm going. Yes, okay, I see what you're saying. Um, well, you know, what's interesting is, like I said, you know, there on Friday, we saw that weather forecast, yet we were still trading higher. So, to me, that's suggesting that this is more than just a plains issue. This is an also, you know, what's going on in the Black Sea area. And also, you know, again, that lower dollar is a really big factor for wheat, and that's something that people kind of sleep on. Commodities as a whole, uh, you know, I, I was seeing some uh, pretty savvy, uh, these are Wall Street sort of guys or whatever, talking about commodities being up 30% over the next year because of the weakness in the dollar. And I'm sitting here as a grains trader and livestock trader saying, <laughs> okay, we've already done that almost. But, but, you know, it's just the fact that, you know, that lower dollar is now bringing the attention of a lot of, 
other investors now wanting to look at commodities saying, hey, you know, this is an inflationary type thing. That's a wonderful environment to be to be throwing on top of what are already some fundamentals that are either bullish or turning more bullish, depending on which, you yeah. know, which of the grains we're talking about. Goldman Sachs is who made that uh, That's right. uh, statement that you're saying. Real quick on wheat, are you selling or are you holding for a little higher right now? Hmm, chart looks good. Um, you know, I, I really like the idea of owning puts in the wheat, you know, just having that floor underneath because we are at some really nice levels. It is fairly simple and not terribly expensive to come in and own some puts at decent levels to have that protection. But I'd like to leave the upside open as much as possible because I really do like the wheat, the wheat chart right now. And again, the way that all the fundamentals for the grains as a whole are kind of turning more and more positive, I, I think there's more upside. Was corn being pulled by wheat or is that export news that was driving that train? You know, corn's an interesting story. You've got a lot of bears out there that just want to point to, you know, almost a 2 billion bushel carryover projection and say, we've got all the corn we need. We shouldn't be rallying in corn. But what they're missing is that this is actually a demand driven market. This isn't a supply side thing. Uh, if China's willing to come in and pay, and not just China, we're seeing unknown destinations in Mexico come in on a daily basis buying corn. If they're willing to pay for it, well, let's see if they're willing to pay at higher prices. And it is a much more friendly story than what we've been seeing. And also, you know, it's keeping with the corn and soybean ratio. It's playing a little bit of catch up here. So I like the way corn looks. It's getting very overbought right now. I think that you might want to look at making more cash sales in corn right now. Depending on where you're at, I think the idea of making cash sales here and keeping basis open might actually work out really well for you in the, over the course of the next few weeks to a few months. But I think corn can stay strong maybe through mid-December or so. I worry that when we get to the January report and we see the final production number for corn that that yield might actually go higher. I know people will want to be, well, argue with me or be mad at me for saying that. But listen, we're hearing a lot of really strong test weights on really dry corn. It had been the opposite the last couple of years and we've seen production reductions. This is a year where I think we can say, well, coming across the, the monitor, it wasn't that great, but you know, when we're going across the scale, it's a lot better because of that test weight. I wonder if we're at a 179, 179 and a half for corn, but that's not something we're gonna have to be terribly concerned about yeah. the USDA revising until we get to January. All right, uh, on the drive, did you see much in the field still? Lots of signs, lots of political signs. Oh, well, that's, that's yeah. <laughs> They're not going to get harvested for another two weeks. No, that's those. correct. But, uh, <laughs> that was the corn... my joke, Paul. Oh, that was? Yeah. Did I steal your joke? You're good, though. It's oh. good. It's a good joke. Okay. Um, you yeah, know, hardly any beans out there anymore. I mean, this bean crop is, for the most part, in, I think. And uh, in northern Illinois and, and through Iowa, I, I saw hardly any beans at all. There's still some corn out there, as to be expected. I mean, look, it's it, we're not... <laughs> It's early still, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, wow, we were we were rolling on harvest, and and I gotta say, you know, usually when we get to forty to sixty percent done on harvest for corn or beans, it's usually when we say, okay, harvest pressure is for the most part behind us. I really feel like that is the case at this point. We really don't have a whole lot of harvest, and the way soybeans found some strength at the end of the day on a Friday, yeah, that's really telling you that harvest pressure is maybe behind us at this point. And that opened lower, and I was I was getting ready to you know do the figures and say, well, maybe only a dime, but we end up putting a quarter on. Does uh, harvest highs are such a weird thing to say? But it's mm -hmm. are we going higher? Uh huh. Yes. Wow, that's a great question. And when we were talking about this back in February, you know, my answer to that question was absolutely. I was very very bullish, and you know, here we are. It's a lot easier to be bullish at 8.30 than it is at 10.80, for example. Um, and, and you look at the price action that we saw in soybeans this week. It's a very reluctant price action, kind of tired, acts like they wanted to try to push it lower. Now, they weren't really able to do that, which I think is why we got a fair amount of that strength at the end of the day on Friday. That was impressive. I feel like we are going higher in the near term, but there is a big contingency of the trade that wants to look at South America, wants to look at that weather forecast, and wants to say that Chinese buying is going to slow down at the very least. If not, we're going to see some cancellations. So that part of the market is going to continue to try to sell soybeans on rallies. But when all is said and done, I don't think China is buying out of fears of South America. I mean, that might have been part of it, but I think they have other motivations as well. I really think that there is a clear path to running out of soybeans this year. And if, if we keep seeing these export sales on a daily and weekly basis in the big numbers that we have been seeing, we have more work to do to price the ration soybeans. 
I really do think at some point, uh, 11.47 is now my next major target to the upside. Obviously, the psychological $11, but there's not a whole lot there. 11.47, and then we start talking about the $12 number. Yeah, I, I seem to think somebody was on the show a couple of weeks ago talking about ranting about beans going higher, but I just, I'm foggy on it. Sorry, I forget. All right. I uh, might remember that too. You might remember that a little bit. Uh, I have a question uh, about protecting yourself that came in yeah. uh, via uh, Twitter. Merrill in Iowa was asking me, he says, Ted, you know, you were talking about these gains, but he's like, what's the plan to protect yourself as, yeah. these, as these bull rallies never end well? Yeah, and they don't. And, and there's so many potential black swans out there. You know, I, I, look, this trade deal could go south at any moment. Uh, election, COVID, so many things, right? So I really don't mind making cash sales here if you haven't been aggressive on that already. If you have, well, then you don't really have much to protect. But if you do have cash sales to make, go ahead and do some of that. Now, look for pullbacks and reown with calls, things like that. Don't worry about missing out on too much opportunity. Yes, it'd be nice to sell the high. It's always nice to help sell the high, but you're, you're really very profitable at 1080 beans on the board. Go ahead and make cash sales, okay? Same thing for corn. We talked about that. You know, 418 corn. Oh, boy. Nobody thought we'd be there. I really don't mind making cash sales. And then, you know, even looking into next year, we can start talking about using put protection or HTAs or, or using the board to sell 10 to 15% of next year. I like doing that. You need to be aggressive on your market marketing. You need to take advantage of this. Even if you're super bullish, like some of us are, you still need to be making those sales. All right. What, what has been good for corn and soybeans has not been good for the livestock sector. Right. We need to get to cattle. Um, consumers, we were just talking before you got here uh, with some folks in the control room about prices. How come I don't see a lower beef price in the store yet, yeah. especially when we've fallen out 8 9 $10 over a two-week period? How long does that matter, and what's that tied to the consumer and what the December cattle is doing right now? Because look at it. It's fallen off the cliff. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, you know, first of all, seasonally, this, this is, it's been a very steep decline. Uh, but I, I think it was, I, I think it took a little time longer setting up than I thought it would have. I kind of thought we'd start to see a slower decline maybe three weeks before we did. You saw box beef prices coming down. I thought cash would weaken sooner than it did. But when it did, it came down quickly. And the futures, you know, responded to that as well. Um, I think we're getting close to a bottom in cattle. I, domestic demand, I think, is really very good, despite the fact that prices haven't really come down at the store. There was a, a fair amount of, of packer risk with COVID and concern. I, I don't agree with the higher prices. I kind of understand it. I don't love it. Yeah. Um, I don't think that really hurts demand, though. I, I think demand, for the most part, is going to stay really rather strong, and especially as we get into the holiday season, I, I see a, a big rebound in cattle. We just saw a cattle on feed report, which was really quite bearish. We're seeing... You know, we saw the highest number of cattle on feed that we've seen since the beginning of the reporting. It's a big number, okay? But we were expecting that. We knew it. It was maybe a little bit worse than what we were expecting. But the marketing's number was good, too. So that means that we, we do have that good demand out there. Again, I, I, 101, 102 was kind of where I was projecting the December live cattle to get down to and then to see a, a nice little bounce and maybe a resumption of the uptrend from there. That's still what I'm hoping for. We're getting into these value price levels now at this point, so I'm looking more at being a buyer at this point. Okay. I don't, I'm not terribly worried about more downside. All right, we need a quick, you mentioned feeders just a little bit, yeah. but they're having problems on the inputs with that corn going right. higher, looking for other rations. I mean, what are your options right now for your feeder? Well, rock in a hard place, right? I mean, you've got dryness in the plains, so, you know, pasture and range conditions continue to deteriorate, and then you've got corn prices, which are up almost every day, it feels like, uh, which corn's very overbought, so hopefully there'll be a correction there at some point for these guys, for, for cattle feeders. Uh, there too, though, I think we really have put a lot of pressure on feeders. We've come down to areas where I think we should be fairly well supported. I'm looking for the cattle complex as a whole to find some good footing at this point and start to try to come back. It might be a little early, but over the course of the next week or two, I think we'll probably have our lows in and we'll start to turn this around a little bit more. Conversely, hogs had been higher yep. and now they just started to pull back. Is that a reaction to cattle or is there something else there? I, there's a number of things going on with hogs. You know, for one, we were really getting very optimistic that China was going to come in and, and buy more of our pork. We thought, okay, their, their, their uh, stocks are getting really tight. They need more. And, and three weeks ago, we saw them come in for almost 30,000 metric tons, and we got really excited about that. We were hoping to see that follow up in the coming weeks. It didn't happen the last two weeks. They were on the board, but barely. So that has been a bit of a letdown. Uh, but hey, you know, you had a bull market that got overbought, just like we were talking about in corn. 
it, we're due for correction. You know, Thursday we, we had a big down day, but we hit right where our trend line was. We held it. We had a bounce back on Friday. If we can continue that strength into early next week, I think we go back and get near or at least test those highs uh, that we saw, get into the 70, 72 range for the December hogs, which, by the way, is, is where I've been talking about. When hogs were down at 52 to 54, I was saying before expiration in December, I think we'll get somewhere between 72 and 74. We've done that. I don't know if we need to go much higher than that, but that was sort of a value range. And I think okay. we can kind of trade sideways here for a little while. All right. I always have to cut you off. I'm yeah, sorry. But guess what? We're going to keep talking. Perfect. Thanks, Ted. Thank you. All right. That'll do it for this installment of Market to Market. We will talk more in Market Plus because, you know, Ted and I have a lot to cover. So join us there. You can find it on our website of markettomarket.org. Now, the harvest pictures were replaced by snow ones this week. But we still, they were pretty neat to see in our Instagram feed. You can tag us at Market to Market Show, and we may feature some of your content for others to see. Next week, we'll learn more about the amount of damage weather has had on the U.S. in 2020. Until then, thanks for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.